excited that you have chosen to join us this afternoon. And to begin with, I would like to recognize and thank Dr. Mm -hmm. Ronald Chilko, uh, as well as his former students and colleagues who generously contributed to the creation of this endowment that makes this fellowship possible. Our presenter this afternoon is Andrew Smolsky. He's a doctoral candidate and instructor at North Carolina State University in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Uh, he's our ninth fellow since 2008. Previous fellows have come from England, Spain, two from Brazil, two from Cuba, Chile, and a SUNY Stony Brook doctoral candidate from Paraguay. Uh, Mr. Smolski arrived last week and will be with us on campus until the coming Monday. His application title for this fellowship was From Rift to Restoration in Mexico and Cuba, Comparing Sustainable Agriculture in Contrasting Political Economic Opportunity Structures of the Modern World System. He used words like incorporative and exilic structures, as well as restitution of uh, metabolic rifts. This is certainly not my area of expertise, so I had to ask him several questions to understand his application. And this led to wonderful exchanges via email, uh, for, which for me were mind-expanding. And as I've stated to him since his arrival here at uh, UCR, I've opened up my cornucopia of miscellaneous information and let him fill it up. And I'm sorry he can do that for you this afternoon as well. And I found his article, Lessons from Exits Foreclosed, an exilic interpretation of the Mexican and Russian revolutions, 1910 to 1924, in Capital and Class, 2018, not only furthered my understanding of the Russian Revolution, but more importantly to me, deepen my knowledge of Mexico during the revolutionary period. One outcome of revolution was land reform, and Andrew argues that land reform is linked to a more sustainable form of agriculture. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Andrew Smolsky. Thank you all for having me today. Uh, as the title on the screen says today, we're just discussing agrarian structures and sustainability in agriculture. I uh, just want to mention that I'm also a fellow with the Center for Environmental Farming Systems at North Carolina State University. And uh, while they fund me, uh, the statements here today are my own, don't reflect the organization. Uh, first, to begin with, the introductory comment. The way that I came to this uh, project was really uh, about reviving these old debates about the difference between capitalist and socialist states within the world system. That is, uh, is a socialist state, by then to being a socialist state, or having a communist party outside of uh, the world, uh, capitalist world economy? Actually, one of the people that I'm basing this work off is here today. Uh, I won't call attention to him, but he's sitting over there. Actually, he doesn't call attention to him. <laughs> Uh, in those debates, it was about whether or not these countries uh, are within this world system or we can consider them outside. And based upon my exilic understanding of these countries, I would say that they are still within the capitalist world economy. That is, they're still within this modern world system and having to compete with capitalist co uh, countries, quote unquote. Another big thing that concerned me and how I got brought to this uh, topic was um, what I would like to call learning from rather than preaching to me. Periphery. Uh, and this is uh, huge for me, uh, right? Because what typically goes on is uh, developed countries tell underdeveloped countries, or core countries tell peripheral countries what to do, how to do it, the best ways to get things done, and never really ask questions like, well, how are you doing it before? Was the way that you were doing things uh, actually effective? And some of this I'm basing on the ideas that I get from Enrique Dussel in his Filosofía de la Liberación and Aproximarse al Otro, right? That what we have to do is instead of learning from the core, we should learn from the periphery. We should find out what peasants were doing that was sustainable, that had yields that provided them subsistence agriculture uh, beforehand, and from that then maybe find a, a, a way forward. And by a way forward, I mean we're facing an agricultural crisis, right? That's the 21st century is facing soil degradation, soil erosion, which I'll get into more when I discuss uh, ecological Marxism and the metabolic rift. But in a major way, thinking about then agroecology as the solution, right? That is, thinking of agroecology as anti-systemic resistance, as a way to build from the periphery a new model of being and an alter modernity, if you wanted to call it that, right? And by 21st century agricultural crisis, uh, I just want to note some key things here. One, we don't have a production problem. Actually, we overproduce food. Um, 
The problem is, is that what we produce, 50 plus percent of it is what we could call junk food. You know, we make uh, wheat and soy and everything so that Dunkin' Donuts can produce as many donuts as they want to never miss a sale, and then chunk as many of them into the dumpster afterwards. So we're facing uh, a problem of overproduction, right, of nutrient deficient food, uh, as well as a problem of distribution. That is, we're overproducing, but yet somehow have 800 million people that aren't fed. Right? So that's our agricultural crisis, and that's together how I came to this project, how I said, okay, well, what do we do if the 20th century saw um, alternative projects to capitalist countries fail, where, where do we go from there? And that brings me to, well, I'll get to it in a second, my presentation map. One, the theoretical basis for this argument, right, which is world system, metabolic rift, and exile, which I'll get to in further detail. After, the theoretical conjectures that follow from that, right, what, uh, both at a national level and an organizational level. After, the data sources. Next, the cases. First case I'll start with is Cuba, and then after I'll go to Mexico, actually. They're switched. I'll be starting with Mexico and then I'll go to Cuba. And then discussion and concluding remarks. So, first big thing, world system. So for those of you that aren't sociologists, uh, world system analysis is a framework that looks at a unitary whole that says um, a, at the current juncture a, in a capitalist world system that it is all-encompassing. It is the unit of analysis. It's from this unit of analysis that we examine the rest that will come from it. So the core, semi-periphery, periphery in terms of a hierarchy of countries that are situated relative to their ability to extract surplus value from uh, a hierarchy of production processes, right? So peripheral countries, you can think of as extraction points for raw materials. Semi-peripheral countries is situated between, you know, being just an extraction point to not having the fully value-added products like, say, your iPhone, right? You, uh, this right here is worth a lot of money once it's sold in the United States, but the production process that gets it from the cobalt in Africa to the factory in China ran by Foxconn where the workers jump off the roofs so they put nets around the factories to the point of sale to you and I when we purchase it, right, that that core is able to extract the most surplus value from the production of this product. And what has happened over the course of the development of this world system is a further and further incorporation of more and more geographic areas of Right? And by incorporation, what it means is that we commodified their social relationships. We said, instead of having substantive reproduction, where we're reproducing ourselves based upon uh, cultural values, based upon, say, ideas about reciprocity, uh, Marcel Mauss would say, gift exchange, right? Instead, it's about buying and selling. Right? So what we're, our goal is, is to accumulate, right? get more profit, or to get capital to turn something into an exchange value in the old Marxist way of thinking about it, that is uh, something that can be exchanged for a price in the market so that I can derive some economic value from it. So this world systems perspective is, is important here because what it's saying is, is if this capitalist world economy, right, which is the modern world system, incorporates the whole globe at this moment in time, then those socialist countries, nominally called, are also going to be a part of this. And so while maybe internally, and then we'll get into this with the Cuba case, they're not uh, basing their relationships uh, on uh, commodified forms of being, that is they're not buying and selling their labor power, et cetera, that on an international scale, as a relationship between peripheral country to core country or semi-peripheral country to core country, they are having a commodified relationship. You know, and with Cuba, we'll see that that's being played out in major ways in agriculture, especially due to sugar. The next big thing, and I, you know, the, the real crux of this argument, if we're going to be thinking about agriculture, is ecological Marxism and the theory of metabolic rift. The theory of metabolic rift is that economic cycles overcome ecological cycles. That what we have to do in order to produce enough in agriculture, right, is we have to speed up production beyond what nature does. You know, if you think about nitrogen cycles, well, nitrogen cycles don't move at the rate of capital production, right? 
Nitrogen cycles actually have a different rhythm. Plants don't fix nitrogen at the rate that we want them to fix it. And what happens? Well, if we apply too much nitrogen, it gets into our groundwater and flows, and then it causes blue, uh, causes blue baby syndrome. Right? Because if there's too much nitrogen in the water they're drinking, they start to asphyxiate over time. And that's because of what we call the rip. Right? If the soil can't absorb the nitrogen, that's because the cycle is broken down. It's not able to recycle those nutrients in the way that it did before. And because capital requires to push it forward faster, more so, they're going to cause more and more rifts. So there's rifts in nitrogen, there's rifts in phosphorus. If you think about the moldboard plow, what a moldboard plow does is it takes the six inches of topsoil, goes in, flips that over, right, and releases all that carbon, destroys all that organic matter. So all of the stuff that had been built up over years and years and years, all the soil nutrients, all the, 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 the biomass, all of the microbial life, all of that gets destroyed in order for us to be able to speed up the production process, to increase the yield so that we can accumulate further, to compete better in the capitalist world economy. Right? And that is something, right? In terms of, and there's a Deleuze quote I've always liked about that, Everything about capital is rational except capital itself, right? Because in terms of you know, this system, that is a totally rational way to do that. You need to accumulate capital, so you're going to do what is necessary to increase that production, regardless of whether or not it causes these risks. And another big thing that comes out of this, though, is then the concept of restitution. Because if we've caused risks, then we're going to need to figure out how to fix those risks. And that's where this project really gets um, its basis because I, I'm an optimist and I try and look for solutions and restitution means that I have to look for solutions. How do we make an agriculture that is sustainable? And also that rift often is associated only with uh, capitalist states, but my argument here is if a socialist state is in the world system, then they're also going to be causing rifts. Right? So restitution here is uh, thinking about well, what will it mean to actually uh, build an agriculture that's sustainable that recognizes that possibly what we'll have to do is go into exile. And I really like this concept. One, because I, I kind of have a love for the, the idea of the maroons. You know, I'm in North Carolina at the moment, a great dismal swamp is very near to me. And what the great dismal was during the late 1700s was a refuge for, for freed slaves, for uh, different uh, uh, original peoples to get away from the, the burgeoning plantation economy of the South, and they were able to resist from that point for decades. I mean, finally, you know, they get destroyed, which kind of happens with this. But it was from this place of exile, this place outside of the world system, where they were able to reproduce relationships based upon equality, autonomy. That they were able to be an anti-systemic resistance. They're able to challenge those dominating processes, and by challenging them, create something different, something alternative, something that doesn't have to be based upon me selling my labor or purchasing products, but instead that we can change a uh, trade based upon reciprocity. Ideas of credit, but credit that we're not marking down in a register, but instead of generalized mode of, well, I don't have to say tit for tat, I know that if I do this, that down the line, somebody will do that for me. Right? And so exile is built on more than just to call the autonomy. There's four key concepts, and we're not going to get too far into them because we only have an hour, and this is just a brief sketch of a lot of big things. <laughs> but there's substantive reproduction, which is coming from Polanyi, Karl Polanyi, who says substantive reproduction is distinct from formal reproduction. Formal reproduction is that tit for tat, that idea of I need a market price. Substantive is instead, we have cultural values that link us together, and through those cultural values, we can reproduce ourselves. In Cuba, and also the Hito system I'll discuss, that is playing a bigger role, right? In Cuba, especially during the periods of increased moral incentives, and doing away with money almost altogether, it's very much about trying to create a system based upon substantive reproduction. And tied into that is what the old anarchist concept of mutual aid, right? That is, a, you know, if you're going to have substantive reproduction, you're going to have to have people thinking that, you know, we're in this together. Uh, I actually, Facebook today showed me a picture I took of a California, San Francisco anarchist bookshop called Bound Together, and it made me giggle. Because Bound Together, of course, is very much about mutual aid. 
We're in this together. How do we accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish? The other two big things tied into equality, right, is egalitarianism and direct democracy. Direct democracy is really crucial here because it's about people making the decisions themselves, not having an intermediary party of a representative that, in the case of bureaucratism, right, could uh, begin to you know, bring resources to themselves and distribute them in order to maintain and reproduce their own power. It's about people having to participate. And I've always liked this about the anarchists because they do have a lot about responsibility that often gets missed with what they're discussing. If you have direct democracy, that means you have an obligation. You have to participate. Why? Well, because the only way that this will get done is if everybody participates, right? And then the other is egalitarianism. That power has to be equalized. You know, if somebody has more power than another, then therefore their decisions will carry more weight, and then the problems that can, not always, but can, you know, arise from that. If I get to make decisions, and say I'm a bureaucrat or I'm a capitalist, in either case, I will make decisions that will benefit my power structure to the detriment, possibly, of other power structures. And within the capitalist world economy, that could mean not diversifying the things that we're going to produce in agriculture uh, and instead focusing on sugar or focusing on wheat or sorghum, uh, whichever would be a staple commodity crop that could bring us more revenue uh, either to the state or to the business overall. Right? So these three parts, good on time because I'm going to talk. Okay. Um, these three parts together uh, form the core of my theoretical uh, argument. Right? And from there, I have uh, two conjecture sets, you can say. And these are simplified for the fact that I have an hour to get them through. So take that with a grain of salt. But in their broad <coughs> outlines, these are definitely the arguments that I'm working with in my dissertation. And what I've been doing while I'm here in the archives is looking for evidence that either supports or invalidates the argument that I put forward. Right? And that can invalidate, I think, is a crucial point here. Right? I, I have a theory, but it doesn't mean that the theory is automatically right. The data has to show. First point, on the national level. And just thinking about Cuba, but this applies in both cases, and I think applies more generally. First, countries within the modern world system are more likely to practice environmentally unsustainable agriculture. That is, there's going to be social structural pressures that push them to intensify agricultural production by dint of being a part of this overall world system. Right? Therefore, despite being ruled by a communist party, Cuba, and by extension the Soviet Union, and I would actually argue uh, more so in the Soviet Union, but that's an argument for a different day, uh, were within the capitalist world economy. Right? That is, they are competing. And uh, I'll discuss it a little bit more when I get to the Cuba case, but this, this wouldn't be news to the Soviet Union. <laughs> you know, I mean, by the time 1924, 1922 rolls around, they're already implementing what's known as the new economic policy. You know, they're already discussing uh, what they would call state capitalism. So for them, this isn't like, I think, uh, like revelation, right? Uh, they understood it. But for many people, especially in a capitalist country like the United States, the core of the system, that is news. Because we don't tend to think about the Soviet Union or Cuba as utilizing market principles, especially in the international arena. And so therefore, if Cuba is within the capitalist world economy or the modern world system, it is more likely that they will uh, practice uh, environmental, uh, to be environmentally unsustainable while part of the Soviet subsystem. And this is key, and we'll get to this in a second, wall part of. And that's because the special period presents us with uh, a, a forced exile from the modern world system in many ways. Not absolutely. None of these should be taken as absolutes, but in a way that most other countries have not experienced. Right? Next, organizational level. Right? Uh, the more exilic an organization is, and that is exile can be able to denote different scales, and that's another, I think, key feature, right? Like, we have different scales, different scales can operate autonomously from other scales at the same time that they're within those scales, right? So there's always this level, uh, you know, once again, Marx's term, dialectically uh, related, where the organization situated within the larger scale can have some uh, capacity to operate outside of that scale. So that an organization that is uh, exilic is more likely to practice environmentally sustainable agricultural production, 
a hedos by dint of the level of uh, decommodification and autonomy are more likely to be exilic organizations, right? And therefore, ahitos are more likely to uh, practice environmentally sustainable production. Uh, now, some caveats here, right? One, it's a continuum. These aren't absolutes, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, for, don't mind those errors. <laughs> for um, Andrzej Grubicic and Denis O'Hearn, who developed this theory of exile, they uh, have different types. They talk about exit with autonomy, exit without autonomy. So exit with autonomy would be more like your Zapatista communities, right? They're outside of the state. They, um, to a, a much larger extent, have egalitarian and direct democratic institutions. Uh, and so they have exit with autonomy. Exit without autonomy uh, could be, and I argue this, uh, Cuba during the special period, right? They're more or less outside of the, the modern world system, but at the same time, there is not a direct democracy to the level that you would see in, say, the Zapatista communities. And then they also have um, a, a type uh, called autonomy without exit, which I won't be getting into here today, but they're utilizing that for things like prisoners in solitary. So political prisoners in solitary that are able to develop modes of being to resist you know, the uh, homo, homo sasser of their life. That is, you know, being like, they're being left without citizenship rights, et cetera, but they create a new culture of resistance, right? And then the other thing, right? It's a dynamic process. You know, it changes over time. So, you know, for instance, the Ahitos in 1940 are not the same as the Ahitos in 1970 are not the same as the Ahitos in 2000. And that's really crucial here because it, I, I'm arguing that the Ahitos, when they're more exilic, are more sustainable, but over time they are more incorporated. Especially once we get to Carlos Salinas de Gotari and the reforms to Article 27, which allow them to sell their land. They don't sell their land, but it places more market pressure on them and therefore intensifies agricultural production. Right? So these caveats, I think, are crucial. One, it's a continuum uh, of exile and incorporation, and then also it's a historical process that's changing over time. So we can't say, oh, Cuba is this, or the ajitos are that. We have to say, Cuba, at this moment in time, under these conditions, demonstrates these characteristics, which then shift uh, accordingly. So, my data sources, uh, one uh, for the day, and I've been working diligently to bring these in as much as possible within my week time frame, uh, is the Ronald H. Shilcock Collection on Latin America, which is why I'm here at the moment, and thank you to Ronald and Lap for allowing me to do that. This picture is actually from one of the newspaper clippings that I found in there. This is uh, from the Mexican Revolution. This is the, uh, the Ejército Libertador del Sur. Right, so Zapata's army, right? And I really love this picture. Actually, I made this my Facebook profile picture at the moment. I really <laughs> love this. <laughs> the other thing, uh, Mexico and agricultural sensei, census. I'm never quite sure on the plural of that one, uh, but there's two types. There's the agricultural census overall, and then there's also the ejidal census, right? So they, they are, you know, themselves as a government differentiating these different uh, organ uh, organizations uh, in agriculture. And then the other big one is uh, Cuba and their uh, annual statistics, which uh, is a, a big giant thing, especially getting towards the 80s, that does provide a lot of data on this. And then in these two cases, what I'm looking for is data on amount of land and agricultural production, uh, fertilizer usage, uh, herbicide usage, pesticide usage, insecticide usage, fungicide usage, etc. Also things like heavy machinery. You know, how many tractors do they have? Are they using ox to, to plow the field? If they're using ox to plow the field, then we can know from a uh, point of view of uh, crop science theory that there's going to be less compaction in the soil. If there's less compaction in the soil, that's going to be better for microbial life, it's going to be better for um, it, uh, no-till style systems, because if you have a big tractor and you compact your soil, it's going to be very harmful in the long term for things like also soil erosion, right? So you know, there's this component here of also having to bring in, in, in an interdisciplinary way, our understanding of crop sciences uh, to, to the discussion of the social sciences. 
And then the same goes for Cuba and the annual statistics. And then from the, the, the Chilcot collection, what I've been really looking for, and I've been able to find more and more, is the voice of uh, peasants. What did they say that they were doing? You know, it's one thing to have a statistic that says that they have X number of ox, right? And you're okay, they have X number of ox. Well, that, that tells me something. But it's another thing that C, and I'll bring up a quote here in a little bit, where it says, oh, well, they were intercropping. Or they were utilizing integrated farming. So integrated farming is I have a crop system, and then I also have some kind of animals. Let's say that animal's a ruminant, so a nice cow. Well, why do I want a ruminant on my crop farm? Well, because a ruminant's going to give me manure that I can compost and then reapply as fertilizer. And therefore, I don't have to buy synthetic fertilizer, say, um, nit synthetic nitrogen, which is energy intensive to produce. It requires a process called the Haber-Bosch process, where I have to take nitrogen out of the atmosphere <laughs> and then turn that into the fertilizer I'm going to apply. And then, because it's a standardized system, I'm going to apply 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre, no matter what. Well, that's not good, because remember, blue baby syndrome, that's just one problem. I mean, you can think of the did zones out in the Gulf are being produced by these algae blooms because of things like nitrogen runoff, phosphorus runoff. So they're also destroying our marine systems at the same time that they're harming human life, right? So in those, I wanted to find those voices. And I've been able to find them in newspaper clippings, I've been able to find them in audio recordings, and that's been a big help, because they don't always come out in the discussions by agronomists. Because agronomists, uh, by dint of who they are, and the way that agronomy has always carried, uh, been carried out, don't often concern themselves with the voice of the people. Vox populi is not something they're really concerned about. So going from there, what? Uh, clarifying the ethos, decommodifying land. So decommodifying land uh, can be a range uh, of things. Uh, the first and foremost uh, could be the state taking land out of uh, market cycles, or the, the cycles of capital accumulation. It could also be people going to squat land. Um, so you know, you see an open field, maybe it's not an open field, you see a cattle ranch, and you know that that cattle rancher is going to export that beef, and you could use that land in order to uh, have a subsistence farm, you go and you just take that land, right? So decommodifying land is a key component of the HEDO system, in this instance, through the state. And we'll talk about it more when we get into kind of the historical trajectory of Article 27. And then the other thing, a peripheral mode of cooperation. And by this, there's an other ways that I could phrase this. It could be an exilic way, but then I think I'm doubling up on concepts too much. So we'll just call it a peripheral mode of cooperation or uh, a, a, a substantive mode of cooperation. Right? That they're, at least within the ajito, they're not selling land or stuff to each other. They're not competing on that level. They have to cooperate in order to maintain the ajito. Right? Actually, their competition becomes the landowners that can hire a pillar military force and try and push them off their land, which does occur. Once again, we'll get into that. So thinking about, you know, I was trying to find like a picture of an hacienda with the field, but this is an hacienda. You know, their goal is money, right? So the difference between them and latifundias and the ajito, and so this is a, uh, the ajito land. These are a bunch of people working in the field together and producing subsistence. That is, producing their their means of survival. Now. And this is key, that historical process. The, that doesn't mean that they've always just done subsistence farming. Right? They do, and more and more, especially towards the present, produce for export, produce for the market. But there is more of the production for subsistence going on in the Hito, and therefore more of this idea of decommodified land and this substantive peripheral mode of cooperation. Oh, we see 1910s. Tierra y Libertad, the Mexican Revolution and Agrarian Reform, you know, the Plan de Ayala calling for redistribution of land. You know, we have all of these peasants, we have rural proletarians, they, they're having to, to work in misery for, for other people to produce for export. Uh, if we're talking about the Yucatan and Hennequin production, they're working for international harvesters, so they're not even working for the, a national company, they're working for an international company, right? So this uh, comes up where you have the Mexican Revolution. It leads to Article 27, Article 27 of the Constitution of 1917, which provides the government 
with a legal basis to redistribute land. Now, they don't automatically apply this, right? Actually, uh, in 1930s, uh, before Cardenas, uh, I know I did it wrong. Cardenas. Yeah. Cardenas. <laughs> you know, I can read it, I can speak, but those accents are always going to get me. <laughs> Poor Gringo <laughs> Bain. Right? But uh, Kai is he's very uh, direct about it. He does not think that redistributing land to the campesinos is going to solve problems in Mexico. His argument is basically they're backward, they're too traditional, they're not going to be able to do it. So he is very slow. It's not until you get to Lozaro. Uh, my word is Lozaro. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's not so you get to Lázaro that you uh, see uh, the development of a mass organization, right? A, a, where there's going from, and I want to give the exact numbers here because the, this, it's drastic, right? So before uh, Cardenas, 8.7 million hectares to 780,000 families after him or during his sexenio, 17.9 million hectares to 810,000 families. Doubling, right? Within a six year period, doubling the amount of land that's redistributed. Prior, we're talking a 20 year period of 7.8 million. And a hectare, for those that don't know, is about 2.5 acres, right? So you're thinking this is a massive amount of land. I mean, um, New England is around 40 million acres in size. <laughs> so you think uh, by the time the 60s roll around, 74 million hectare, uh, 74 million acres are redistributed. So uh, an area of land double the size of New England, almost, right? So this is huge. So there, this is all based upon struggle, right? He doesn't get to just redistribute the land. No, he has to develop mass organizations throughout the rural area, and then from those mass organizations, then implement that redistribution. And that class conflict point, right, that matter of anti-systemic resistance, is even bigger for the 1960s. And I, the reason why I say it's even bigger is because, let's see, uh, land seizures, yeah, so land seizures increase, you have uh, 5,000 people take over 40,000 hectares, it's just one instance, right, in 1961. And it's a conflict, so they don't just get to take over the land. And what I found in the, the archive is this story about Ruben Jaramillo. Uh, time and again, Ruben Jaramillo had roused the local peasants to fight for their rights. Under his leadership, some 5,000 had in February 1961 seized nearly 40,000 hectares of land in the Michapa and Guarín districts and divided it among themselves. Ruben, his wife, and three grown, uh, and three grown sons had been taken away by Capitan Jose Martinez in the Zacatepec garrison, that evening the watchman guarding the ruins of the ancient Toltec city of Xochicalco heard a shot in the distance. There came another, and another, and then a pattering of small shot. Though frightened, he walked slowly in the direction the shots came from. An aged peasant lay face down in a dirt road. His hands were flung wide as if to embrace the earth. You know, it's a conflict, right? You know, they don't just redistribute land. There's a pitched battle going on, and that pitched battle is being waged by peasants that are invading land, a, by a federal government that, that at one time redistributes the land, right? But at another sends federales in to protect the landowners. And when they do redistribute the land, they don't give the best land to the peasants. Right? They give degraded land, land that soil has gone away, or land that's in areas that don't rain as much, or land that's too, fi uh, too high in the mountains to be able to use machinery. But we'll get into the fact that machinery is probably not good uh, to utilize right? from an agroecological standpoint. So organizations like the Movimiento de Liberación Nacional were uh, fighting to push forward land redistribution in this period, and also campesino organizations are able to uh, enable a formalization of those land invasions and that land squatting, right? And then, you know, by the 1990s, this all starts to peter out, right? 
We don't see, I mean, they're still going on, say in Chiapas, right, uh, in the 1990s, uh, post-Zapatista rebellion, there's more of this fight for land, right? Let's see. Uh, oh, I didn't put the exact numbers. I believe it was 35 land invasions that occur in 1994, post-Zapatista rebellion, and many of those end up actually being redistributed, but they're largely not coming from, say, the Pre, the Pan, the Pererete, they're not fighting to implement Article 27 anymore. Uh, 2.5 million were still without land by the time that this reform occurs. Right? And then, also, by then, uh, Mexico is now uh, an importer of corn by the 1990s. And I have at my home in North Carolina uh, the, uh, La Jornada, an issue of La Jornada, and has Three stories. The first one says, Mexico now a top 10 exporter of agricultural production. Bottom story, Mexico increases import of corn 53%. Side story, <laughs> a Mexican campesino organization asks, where's the subsidies? Right? So there is a reorientation of the Mexican state away from what wasn't always the most radical kind of land reform, but a form of land redistribution. And we can see this come out in the statistics, right? You know, the heat of land, you know, in terms of structure, is about half of all land with the communal land. Private land at 73.8 million hectares, the heat of land at 84.5 million. And if we see in terms of ag production and think about intensity, right, that there's less intensity of agricultural production to this day, 2007, on a heat of land. Part of that, of course, is the quality of the land. But another part is that they don't always have to intensify production. They don't have to use all the land uh, by dint of not having to, uh, not having market pressures on them. That is not being fully incorporated. Right? Another big thing in terms of use of the farms. So right, this is total number of ag producing units: three million seven hundred and sixty-two thousand one hundred and ninety-five. The majority of them are for subsistence. Remember once again. The majority of people that are farmers are going to be ejidatarios. Oh, bad day for me. <laughs> and then the next is for local, regional, national sale. That's stuff that's going to say the seda in Mexico City, uh, which is the Central de Abastos, which is an amazing place if you ever get the chance to go. And then after that, just 3,200 of farms for export. Now remember, I mentioned La Jornada, top 10 <laughs> agricultural exporter. Well, how are you a top 10 if only 3,200 farms? And that'll let you know the sizes of these farms, that'll let you know the intensity of production on these farms, that, and that's also where the majority of subsidies are going to go. So these folks, less, those folks, more. And we can see it come out in terms of agrarian practice, right? And we can see also that as time goes on, as there's more pressure being put on ejidos to produce more, because if you don't produce more for sale, then people need to leave. Right? They have to go work elsewhere. And there's a, a very smart person, um, Jessica Ariano Lopez, uh, who did a recent study of how uh, those folks that go elsewhere, that come back to ejidos, bring uh, intensive practices back and then therefore increase production, increase monocropping, et cetera. So you can see here, total number of ejidos, also the doubling that occurs. Right? Uh, ejidos with production, majority of them have it. Ejidos using fertilizer, not that many, not that many. This jumps, ejidos using fertilizer to 18,000 out of 28,000. So not only is there an increase in the number of ejidos, but the intensity of their production over this period is increased. And we can think, well, what's happening in the 1980s? It's the, the oil bubble bursts, there's a crisis going on, structural adjustment programs begin to be implemented, and um, I'm currently building out the data set for the other statistics, and my hypothesis is that this trend continues, that there's increasing intensity of production over that period, which we can uh, guess by I'm sorry, uh, Jessica's work that does show this. Right? Another thing that we can look at, um, so this is steady because they don't have the statistics. This is from the FAO. This is uh, pesticides, right, as a total percentage. Uh, 
in tons that they're utilizing, and it's increasing over this period as they continue the idea of being an exporter. Same with nitrogen per area of cropland. Right? So that means that we're going to see increasing drifts moving away. So even though the ajitos in the beginning more exilic, more decommodified, are, are less intensive over time as these incorporative pressures come on them from the world system, they're going to increase. Now, moving away from Mexico, moving to Cuba. Right? Modern world system. And this is, once again, an oversimplification. We could bust the capitalist world economy portion out. The Soviet world economy, which actually could be the Soviet world system, uh, subsystem is probably a better way to put it. And this could be busted out because Cuba always had you know, relations with Canada, etc. But you think, you know, they're all together, right? Pre-revolution, they're linked into the capitalist world economy or the capitalist core through the United States. That goes away, links to the Soviet subsystem, right? Soviet subsystem disappears. What happens? Cuba is left out. Forced exile. Now, like I said, of course, it's not absolute. There's still relations with Canada, Japan. And then over the period uh, post-revolution up till the special period, you know, the number one place they're getting uh, their pesticides from is from the Federal Republic of Germany, right? which is West Germany. So, you know, they're, they're definitively trading. It's just the main core is the person that is the hegemon. They're not trading with that hegemon, right? And so that gets to my argument. Right? That post-revolution, they're implementing a green revolution of their own making. Right? They're intensifying production, they're bringing in tractors. They might have switched from John Deere tractors to the Soviet Union's tractors, but they're using those tractors. They're bringing in pesticides, fertilizers, they're monocropping sugar, tobacco, they're trying to make sure that they have exports. And sugar, even at, at its lowest point, is, is still three-fourths of export. Right? And other than this period, automatically post-revolution, uh, from 1959 to about 1962, before a giant hurricane hits, that's the only time that they're really having a major plan for diversification. Post that, the plan is the 10 million tons uh, of sugar. Right? And that means if you want 10 million tons of sugar, you're going to have to intensify your inputs in a massive way. And they only get up to 7.1 million tons of sugar, which is still a lot of sugar. And they're able to do this in another way because they're able to have um, non-market prices, right? The way that they're trading with the Soviet Union is not the same way that they were traded with the rest of the world. They're trading in a more barter system. They're taking their sugar, giving it to the Soviet Union post-1973, the Comic-Con, and then they're getting back from that oil. And, as we should know, uh, agricultural, industrial agriculture is intensive because it's petrol-based. Your pesticides are made from petroleum. I mean, not all the time. Your new neonics uh, are made from tobacco plants because you know cigarettes have been declining in use in North America and Europe. So what we do? Well, we took those nice tobacco plants and we found a way to put it into the seed. So you have coated seeds. So the seed actually has already all the neonic you need in it, so you don't have to spray it. But then, guess what? That still kills the bees. Uh, that's another topic for another day. But those neonics aren't that effective as well either. Right? So you have, over that period, um, an, an increasing intensity, especially in the state sector, but right, in the small private farm sector, right, which private, also kind of a mist over here, they don't have to pay for their land. So reduced incorporative pressures on what they're going to do. The 80s, the Mercados Libres, the uh, campesinos, Right, uh, come in, and this is to deal with the black market and the bartering. Uh, at the same time, it leads to speculation, because if you can buy, you can hoard, and if you can hoard, you can keep it off the market long enough to send that price up and you can make more money. Fidel really rails against this. And he talks about uh, democratic centralism, though, tying his hands so that he couldn't shut it down right away. Um, at the same time, uh, they're getting less oil from the Soviet Union, especially towards the later years of the 80s. So they start implementing programs that really explode during the special period. Those are programs of things like biological control, which I'll show you all some uh, data that I really like about what Cuba did during the special period to try to address these uh, inputs, the lack of them. And what we could call an input substitution model as opposed to an import substitution model. Okay? So, one. 
private farms after the first agrarian reform are still the majority of farms. Uh, now there was a heavy reduction in the latifundias, right, the big, big farms, but it's not until the second agrarian reform that you see, which this is, this is pretty stable, this is from 1988, it's pretty stable from the second agrarian reform after. I mean, roughly 30 to 20 percent are these uh, non-private, uh, well, private or cooperative farms, right? And then the state farms about 80 percent. Right? So the argument has been is that this is right, this green revolution model is the state sector, and that these cooperatives and private farms are going to mimic more of what we call an agroecological approach. The reason I say that is. There's a great quote that I found by Juan de Onis in the New York Times from 1964. On the other side of the road are lots, ranging from 15 to 75 acres of small private farmers. They are owners or former tenants who now pay no rent. It's a key factor here, right? They plant tobacco, corn, beans, and tubers, intercropping. And if they are lucky, there is some pasture for a few head of cattle. Pigs, chickens, ducks, and guinea hens are underfoot in every yard. So integrated farming. Right? It's finding these little bits of evidence. Well, they're practicing things that nowadays, if you go to an agroecology program or a program, usually they have to call it sustainable food systems because the other agronomists will say, well, we are sustainable, so there's a pitch battle there. Um, but they're practicing what now we would teach to people that want to do small, sustainable farming, intercropping. That is having, you know, I'll have a stretch of sweet potato, then I'll put in a stretch of corn, and then maybe over here I'll put in some beans. Old three sisters model, right? And by dint of that, be able to manage the nutrients in the soil in a way that I don't have to apply as much fertilizer. Right? And that's going to be key because if I'm applying too much fertilizer, I, I'm going to produce those rips. So it's a form of restitution. And we can see it. Herbicide application, percentage of sugarcane area. And the reason it's over 100% is because of uh, more than one application of the herbicide. Uh, so these come from uh, Jose Alvarez, who's a good agronomist, but I disagree with him on his argument about liberalization <coughs> being the way that this will all be resolved. However, he, he's right, right, that the non-state sector is applying less. One, because they don't get the inputs from the state, but another because they, if they're intercropping, if they have diverse things, if they have what we can call like an ugly farm, you know, an ugly farm is going to give you a, a variety of biodiversity that can end certain weeds or protect you against certain pests. And by dint of that, you won't need for a herbicide uh, as much, because there won't be as many weeds. Or maybe you understand the planting cycle enough that you plant knowing that the weeds will grow uh, on week X, but if I plant on week Y, they'll outgrow the weed before the weed can grow and produce shade that kills the weed. Because right? there are other things we can do, and that's restitution. Right? And we see, when we get into the post-Soviet period, this production center is junk. So entomophages and um, entomopathogens, so entomophages are the production of insects. Entomopathogens are the production of bacteria. And there is a question here about quality control, and then we'll leave that to the side for now, and <laughs> whether or not spraying random bacteria could have its own negative consequences. But for the moment, biocides have become the supplement. So as chemical pesticides decline, right, and they're declining beforehand. As I said, oil's already started to decline. The Soviet Union's entering its own crisis in the 1980s. It's pretty apparent. Right? And, but by the Soviet, uh, the collapse, boom, almost you know, going down to 5,000 tons. So real decline. At the same period of time, this is trich trichogramma production. So trichogramma is a wasp. Right? And you can release this wasp. It goes in and it, it oviposits. It lays an egg inside of uh, different uh, larvae and insects that will damage your crop. And by dint of laying an egg in it, uh, at a certain moment in time, the egg pops out of the bug that you wanted to die, and it kills the bug. So your trichogramma wasp doesn't eat your plant and kills your pest. If you ever get a chance, I highly recommend going on YouTube to watch the emerald wasp. <laughs> it injects cockroaches with a venom, turns it into basically like a, a zombie, and it keeps it alive while it's uh, young, 
eventually grow inside and then pop on out. <laughs> right? But so what we see, you know, is that this moment of forced exile across the board. Now those five thousand tons, you know, they're largely gone, right? They're going to sugar and tobacco, right? But they did increase the amount of use of biological control and other sustainable techniques, even in their sugarcane fields, which is why nowadays Cuba has discussions of an organic food market. And when I went down there two years ago, they were discussing how to produce a label put on the food for organics. Although, um, there's another issue that I won't get too far into, but the increasing inequality. Because if you have a label that goes on food that produces a distinction, that means there's an increased price. So there's another problem here that's going on. So there's a level of forced exile at the same time that the neoliberal period is having its effect on Cuban policy. Right? So, conclusions. First one, evidence tends to demonstrate that the further into exile an organization or nation state is, the more likely it is that agricultural production is less intense. Right? And that, that's key. What we're seeing, and there's, there's two ways we can look at that. One is demodernization. Right? They just don't have the inputs. If you don't have the inputs, you don't use them. But another is that they have to make decisions based upon that that increases the likelihood of alternative practices, such as biological control, such as intercropping, such as you know, uh, integrated farming, such as ugly farming, you know, on and on down the line. And we see this here even in the United States. You're small farmers, right, that are having to compete based upon different, uh, different quality uh, assessments, like instead of quality in this instance being like the hygiene of the fruit, it's the flavor of it. There's this uh, guy uh, in Mexico City in, in Santa Ursula, where my wife grew up. Victor is a third generation fruit salesman. Sold me these local mangoes and they were the most amazing thing. And he says, yo, well, look, and he cuts it and the juice just starts flowing out of this thing. Like that's one idea of quality and that's the quality that they're going to think about. And by thinking about that quality, you're going to have to have different methods. Right? For instance, you're not gonna be able to ship your mango all the way across and refrigerate it for three months. Why? Well, because the decline in the taste is going to occur when you do that. Right? So, and the other, it's not a static assessment. How exilic an entity is depends upon the ongoing struggle between incorporative and anti-systemic actors and organizations. As, as, as over time, the hitos get incorporated. Right? Or over time, the Cuban uh, nation state gets pushed out of the world system, then slowly brought back in. Right? I, I've been going through the, the new statistics, more updated statistics for uh, Cuba, and as they get brought back in through their connections to Venezuela and other things, and also joining free trade agreements with uh, Central America, you know, pesticide use starts to go back up. Right, so demodernization is playing a role, but it's also those alternative practices. So that's not static. And then the other big thing, and one that has to get to you know, future studies, is what about yield? We overproduce, but we overproduce stuff that we don't need to eat. What we don't recognize, for instance, is if you actually all started eating the recommended daily plate by the USDA right, of fruits and vegetables, you wouldn't be able to. There's actual scarcity of fruits and vegetables. We only produce 2% fruits and vegetables. So it's kind of lucky that people have bad diets because then you actually get to eat fruits and vegetables. Otherwise, we would be fighting as well right, over that. So is sustainable production pos possible within our material and knowledge base at this moment in time? And that's a huge question. Uh, there's a good study that shows by, uh, from the Royal Society says if we actually invested uh, money into R&D, we would be able to bridge the organic yield gap. Well, that means that we are going to have to shift the way our institutions work. And that, once again, gets to a pitted battle, right? Anti-systemic resistance, once again, corporate forces that then shift the ideas of what the USDA would do, for instance, right? So, selected references, and I can give y'all more if y'all want them. And then, thank y'all. Yeah. Questions? <laughs> I'll jump. <laughs> that was a lot of information. <laughs>
you build, say, campesino on campesino networks that can then share knowledge to address specific concerns and crops. Because maybe, you know, uh, Farmer Joe over here uh, figured out that if he plants, um, you know, uh, marigolds, right, that that'll be a, a push factor. So that'll send certain bugs away from your plant so you can plant, you know, a row of one flower to save it. So is that his project? No. Uh, and so there's still reproduction, even within the FAO, of those models. So moving to the general. So the concrete, the state of Mexico under AMLO does not have a program that we could say is based upon agroecology. It's not based upon land redistribution. And it's not even calling for uh, changing Article 27 back to the way it was before Salinas. This, Right? Um, so at the general level, is there a call? Well, I mean, there's certain organizations that have, I think, mass power, like La Via Campesina, that are pushing for these things, but they're pushing for them uh, in an era of proto-fascism. And that, that's going to be where the struggle is. So the, the uh, landless uh, peasants movement in, in Brazil, Bolsonaro calls them out directly. Right? He says, this is over, we're not going to do this anymore. Which is a call for violence, you know, pitted struggle once again. So it, under those circumstances, what are the possibilities of it? The optimist in me, reality is uh, as radical as you demand of it. Right? But the realist of me, what are our organizational capacity to confront these things when we don't have possession of states? <laughs> Uh, not sure. I'm not sure that there's too much capacity. Mm -hmm. And then that's why people fall back on the market as movement model. Well, what's your capacity to do agroecology? Well, the capacity to have rich people buy your products. Well, that's not going to expand. I mean, we're already on a plateau. Right. Um, the anarchist in me <laughs> would say that uh, in those countries, in the semi-periphery and uh, periphery, where it's still possible to do so, it take over some territory. In the core, mm, I think the options are a lot more. Vote Democrat? I'm not advocating that, by the way. No. <laughs> that, that seems to be what the fallback yeah. in terms of political strategy for, for all that social movements right now in the US, anyhow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, it's. It, it is the, the current juncture that, that we confront. And the, I, I mean, I will probably get cut by my, my chair, but the way I open my introduction, my dissertation, is anarchy or extinction. And the reason why is because that is something that we are confronting. I mean, if you look at study after study, you, know, you have the sixth great mass extinction. You have a declining insect population. You know, what we're going to be left with is mosquitoes. Who here likes mosquitoes? Raise your hand if you like mosquitoes. <laughs> right? No. Uh, you know, uh, confronting that, so, so we're in a catch-22 once again, where we, we have states that are ecocidal, uh, options that are viable, that are rationally based, movements that would push those forward, but they're movements without state power and also without, I think, substantive power. You know, Outside of their own communities, most people don't know what La Via Campesina is. If I go to Mexico City and I go do a survey of people on the street, the majority are not going to, the overwhelming majority are not going to be able to tell me that this organization exists. That's an important question. <laughs> I should have a more optimistic mind. Okay, we'll go here. This quick and simple question. What would you classify then, uh, like, so the difference between Mexico and Central America as far as semi periphery or periphery? Are they, are they kind of the same? Or are they, are they uh, uh, yeah, asking the shapes? Mm -hmm. um, well, me Mexico, one way you can think about it is you know, uh, the, the telecoms in Central America, who owns them? Uh, it's Salinas. I'm uh, not Salinas, sorry, Slim. Right? It's, it's Telmex in many countries. Right? Not, you know, not in all of them, but in many of them. And there's pitched battles. So if, if Mexico 
uh, owns major industries in Central America. That's because Central America is the periphery. Mexico is the semi-periphery. It's the regional powerhouse. So you have Mexico and Brazil as regional powerhouses, as semi-periphery in terms of their production processes. But then you also have to think within Mexico are areas that are peripheral. Right? You know, Mexico City is, is, is so dominant uh, the, I used to have the exact percentage of the economy that flows through it on the top of my head, but I don't at the moment. But I mean, it's overwhelming the, how much of uh, Mexico's economy is just centered within Mexico City. And then if you look at Chiapas or Guerrero, you're not looking at a, a semi periphery anymore. And there's a reason why then that in Guerrero there's so many narco forces because the levels of social exclusion, of poverty, et cetera, uh, are already so high that it becomes uh, or produces conditions for a killing field. So I would say Mexico is the semi-periphery, and the Central America is the periphery, and Mexico in many ways is able to extract surplus value from, the, uh, from Central America such as people like Slim. I mean, Slim even telecom in Colombia. Not all of it, but you know, he's a major player. And also kind of corrupt, but you know, <laughs> That's a very good question. Oh, yeah. Uh, your anecdotes came across as um, recognition bad, obviously good. Is there no hope for the high tech sustainable experiments going on in Europe and the United States? Um, well, I think it's a question of how we do R and D. Uh, what we have is heavy machinery at this moment in time is geared toward a specific type of agricultural production, monocropping. I mean, say for instance, you know, we have tractors now that will run on GPS systems. Well, that yeah, actually. <laughs> Your, your farmer is actually falling asleep. He doesn't actually have to drive the tractor. You can run the farms in the city. <laughs> or, or thinking about utilizing drones. I mean, I go to talks because yeah. I'm at a land grant university, so I spend a lot of time with ag folk. Oh, we're at a land grant institute. Oh, this is? Oh, okay. <laughs> we just forgot it. It, never, it didn't have any impact. We didn't even talk Don't about it. Because, <laughs> yeah, because we're the seat of our cooperative yeah. extension. So I go to talks, and what cooperative extension for us is all ag stuff. I mean, it's not like you know, late adult learners or anything. You know, we do one thing, and that's we go and talk to farmers. But most of those farmers are big agribusiness, and so the technology is geared towards that. The drone technology is geared towards that. If we put money into R and D, and we should, one of the things um, bring this up. I mean, this is technology. Mm -hmm. If you're producing a center that's going to breed specific bugs, have quality control, and specific bacteria that you can utilize to combat different fungicides, that's technology. But we have to invest in it, and we don't. And so at the moment, our option really is kind of, you can either do a tractor or you can do an oxen. Um, but that's only because of the way that the system at the moment is operating. I don't think that we have to have like Stone Age agriculture in order to solve the crisis. But we are going to have to readjust the institutions, which gets back to the question about state power, because it is the USDA that's going to supply the money for these things. Even, even globally, it's the USDA that's going to be supplying a lot of the investment. Europe has some of it with biodynamic farming and stuff, but even there, it's still minimal. If you look, uh, they banned a few of the neonics, but you know the, the headline will say, banned neonics. This is actually a misnomer. Ban certain classes of neonics is what it should say. And then also they'll say, oh, well, look, there's been a decline in the, the amount of pesticides. Well, that's because we're measuring it still in tons. No, chemistry doesn't automatically relate to weight. <laughs> and also you have to think about the fact that there's, um, oh, my, oh, my good friend and colleague Jason does more on pesticides. What do you say? Synergistic effects. So yeah, okay, well maybe we're using less pesticides, but we're using different classes that when they come together are even more toxic than the ones we used before. So there's other things we'll have to get into, but it's an important question. No, we don't have to go back to the Stone Age, but we're going to have to have a massive shift in the institutions. Ones that aren't coming because apparently Bolsonaro is going to clear cut the 
Amazon uh, so that we can put more cattle. You know? Because we need more beef, apparently. I love how you used the archive and you included it in your presentation. I know you're pretty impressed with what you were finding up there. Oh, yeah. Do well, you want to make any comment on that? Well, the, I, I, I kind of wait for myself. But I have more written down of these fun things. Um, one, 1970s, Car uh, Car Carlos. Carlos. Like Carlos Marquez. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I can't say it. I was telling David earlier. Also, the anger and the says But he says in his Testamento, right, this dizzying reversion toward a neo latifundismo operates against the organization and consolidation of the Aquino system, and naturally against the basic socioeconomic object objectives of the agrarian reform. But the incentive to profit, large and medium mm -hmm. agricultural producers, paradoxically called small property owners, in a country of rapid demographic growth and growing agrarian needs, revert to concentrating property, uh, concentrating property uh, and use of the best land, with the corresponding injuries to ejidatorios and actual small producers. Right? And there's a lot of these good quotes within the archive coming from these newspaper clippings uh, that you know, help to kind of provide more background, especially a lot of Fidel zone discussions. And this is something that I think has to, to get brought up, that you know, he's in the world system, and not only is he in the world system, but he has the same seductivist mindset as the rest of them. I mean, he's not as bad as you know, some of the folks that are in the, the Soviet Union post-Russian Revolution that are very anti-peasant, right? But he's still saying things about you know the state farms are the best farms. The, you know, we need increasing machinery. We need increasing inputs. Well, all of that puts you at a long-term disadvantage. So the short-term problem, right, of need, needing foreign exchange, leads to a long-term problem where right now they're discussing. If you read Cuba de Bate and other sources, a return to the special period. Right? Because of the conflicts going on with what the walrus wants to call the Troika of Tyranny, right? which is Nicaragua, the walrus is a Little Nicaragua. Yeah. But you know, it, it, there's not enough oils for cooking. There's a, a, a scarcity of bread. Right? And all of those are, are part of a, a continual failure, not just within Cuba, but in, in peripheral and semi-peripheral countries to have an agrarian policy that focuses on diversified production for uh, self-sufficiency or resilience. And just as a side-off anecdote, and I brought this up the other day in our discussion, you know, I asked uh, one of my advisors, Michelle Schroeder Moreno, who's an agroecologist, a very smart person, I go, yo, if, if the global value chains go down, how, how much food does Raleigh have? Where we're at? She says, well, we don't have a study of Raleigh, but we have a study of Iowa, the state of Iowa, the bread basket, and they have three days, roughly, of food if the global value chains go down. Well, that's what agriculture at currently has left us at. And that's a problem. So those things where, you know, you could say it's human exemptionalism throughout, but I don't put that on a matter of socialist versus capitalist states. It's a matter of the way the modern world system operates. There's an ideology there, you know, that focuses on petrol-based development as the way to go. And that is still around, I mean, even now. Even though you talk about some of the things, you gave a lot of good examples and a lot of good statistics, I think the real story of human lives came out of those quotes that you, you read, and those were people being interviewed, like direct, uh, direct knowledge of what was happening there. And I, I just want to make that comment about archives and saving history because we don't we can't all be there all the time and I think what he's probably talking about is Ron's <laughs> decades of reading newspapers in Latin America interviewing <coughs> people seeing them interviewed and uh, collating and bringing them together and giving them to our library and I think that's what I think that's the human element that was added to your wonderful research yeah I mean it's key and you get gems, like the thing I was just talking about, and because you have a lot of Fidel speeches from uh, well, World Outlook you know, and the Continental Press. There's tons of them. And you, sometimes you get some real honesty. 
a lot of the time. He's very transparent in these speeches. And he says, talking about this long-term problem with Fidel, in 1960, 37.3 tons of fertilizer could be bought with a ton of coffee. In 1982, only 15.8 tons could be bought with the same amount of coffee. We, the countries of the third world, export generally coffee, cocoa, other similar uh, agricultural products, and import, import fertilizers from the chemical industry of the developed world. To grow corn or other foodstuffs, we need fertilizers. However, we must deliver more coffee to have less and less fertilizers. And that's the long-term issue. And at the end of the day, that's a systemic contradiction. I, um, then state power should have some role to do there. And the thing with Cuba, especially, you have 12% more or less of Latin America's scientists were in, according to, uh, in this book, uh, Sustainable Agriculture Resistance, Transforming Food Production. They have 12% of scientists, this is in 2003 in Cuba, uh, for all of Latin America. Well, why can't you get them, and they did, you know, during this special period, to focus on this agroecological form of production. And that's where state power can, I think, play a big role. And Bernie, which is this, the demographic here, um, has at least called for some kind of a rule. And in the United States, you know, we don't have farmers. Right. Right. But we have farmers. We did. We, we have, there's, there's about a million farms in the United States. That means that 0.33% of the population of the country, right, is supplying the food for the other 330 million. Now, this isn't the same problem in Mexico and Cuba, and this is why I also think, you know, going to the introduction, why we have to approximate al otro, you know, the periphery. Why the periphery? Well, because the, I think the periphery, in terms of the, the agricultural and ecological crisis, is much better suited to survive. The, the actual, the big problem for the periphery is where they're located geographically, which will harm them more so than their social structural uh, components. Their structural components are, are going to help them, but geographically, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador are going to see so many dangerous days, as they're called, that it will become impossible to live in those areas. And where are they going to go? They come to the states <laughs> until they're turned back at the border. Well, and then, you know, the administration reported today it was planning on rounding up 10,000 people as a shock and awe strategy within the country. Well, uh, that's the plan on there. And so maybe not anarchy extinction or extinction, <coughs> but definitely the, the question is starting to become much more clear. You know, fascism on one side and whatever formation gets produced on the other. I try to be an optimist, that's probably not optimist. <laughs> <We're not. laughs> <laughs> Let me jump in just for a moment. Um, I, I mean, it's interesting that to hear you talk about my archive, which is primarily based on Brazil, but is actually in many, many places in Latin America and also in Africa and also in Europe. Uh, did you delve into the Latin American Perspective Archive in any way? This uh, archive is based on all the material that was received as manuscript. Um, or, or issues that were produced generally thematically over the 46 years of the journal. Uh, it's a massive archive. I think there are probably 170 or so boxes of material. But I'm just curious, you, I don't think you went into that. And you probably know a lot about Latin American perspectives. The stuff that was published is easily available. Um. I have not gotten to those. I went through, so far, the intervention boxes on Mexico and Cuba. I'm currently with the audio tapes, oh, okay. um, which that's been really interesting, uh, mostly because they have to bring out this big machine and then we have to listen to them. But I haven't got to the lap, and my concern will be not having enough time to get to the lap uh, archives. They, you think, you, you, and it's impressive that it lets me know also if when the, if I get to be a scholar, the academy lets me, because you know, otherwise I won't add drugs. I just can't see that happening in my own life. 
but if I did, to save things. And going through piece by piece each newspaper article and reading and seeing, you know, does this say anything that's relevant to the, the discussion that I'm having? I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Like, you have a massive set of papers on Salinas getting elected or the other things. So I haven't got to the lab archives yet. Okay, well, that's interesting to, to discover what you focused on. The interven intervention, uh, well, there are these files on the countries of Latin America because when I came out of Stanford as a student, I was working with people who didn't know very much about Latin America, but they had done dissertation work and then sort of forgotten about it and became experts. And, um, and the teaching was looking at all the different countries. I remember the first course I gave on Latin America here at UCR. It covered most of the countries. And that's why such files were developed. Because you had to keep track of everything at that time. A lot of people around who didn't know very much about Latin America and were trying to understand um, what was going on inside of Latin America rather than what people's opinions and interpretations were outside, people who didn't know very much about Latin America. It was that big gulf, and it's, it completely, um, that has completely been undermined to the point where um, uh, I, I think we're generally, as Latin Americans, we're immersed in Latin America in a ways that we're, we're not, was not happening. In the, in the distant past, there is a tendency of the disciplines to, to gain control of information and direct one's learning. And, and that begins to take it back to where it was 50 years ago. Uh, so uh, all that changed radically because North Americans and Europeans started to go into Latin America and research. And my, I guess my um, desire was to always, to be, spend most of my life within Latin America, not assuming I knew much about it, but being there to learn directly from the situations. Now, in Europe, maybe you could briefly tell us about how you, have become involved in Latin America and the time you've spent in Mexico, Cuba, you mentioned Cuba a couple of years ago. And so, well, so yeah, to answer first Mexico and then tell my fun Cuba story and why Mexico was so made it more difficult. Um, Mexico started as an immersion, Spanish immersion program when I was an undergrad. Uh, and then I became very close friends with the son of the mother of the house that I stayed at. He then invited me back for a birthday party. And uh, the person at the birthday party, who is now my partner, uh, it, I married her from Mexico City. And so I go as much as possible to Mexico. Less so now that my father-in-law died, which made it more difficult in terms of economics. But we'd be going there often. And then so my master's thesis came on Mexico City's public markets because of that connection and also my fascination with the public markets. And once again, getting to that question of what's, the, what's a way out. And I like the public markets to think about markets that weren't capitalist markets, which were kind of like Braudel brings up. So that's where I was spending most of my time in Mexico. And then through my fascination with things like the Mexican Revolution, reading back pages, uh, reading history about that, and then the development also of anarchist thought within Mexico from the mid-1800s going up to the Mexican Revolution. So that's my Mexico basis. Cuba, I've only been to for uh, about a week and a half once. And I've been trying to get back, and I was going to go back uh, for a conference with uh, ACTA, which is the association I'm trying to work with, and then they had to cancel every American's trip there. So this was last year, and so I lost money, and the reason why was there was a change in the visa, and so no longer could you use the, visa, the tourist visa, you had to get a special event visa. 
So I wasn't able to go back. And then I tried to go back again um, this semester. And then the conference, uh, uh, Agricola Cuba, uh, was canceled. And all of this is to do with the shift regionally, which has really kind of barred me from doing what I, I wanted to do. More, This is very macro. I like talking to people. I think you learn more that way. I agree with you on that. Um, and to get back and talk with farmers, and even more urban agriculture is what I'm mean, even more fascinated with, because I don't think we're going to get to be able to do like we did in the dark ages the last time there was regional climate change, which is to disperse out into the woods. You know, you know this time we're going to probably have to concentrate in cities. What is that going to look like? And I think it could be very dystopian, <laughs> but it could also be very utopian, uh, depending upon the conditions. So my hope still to this day is to get back to Cuba, but that seems to be more and more fleeting considering the current political environment where apparently we're going to invade an embassy. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's really powerful. So those are my things. And I'm also working and what I think we would like to talk to y'all about more lab, uh, folks from Latin America who want to work on an issue about agri-food systems and agri-food systems from the point of view of Latin America because a lot of the stuff on agri-food systems is food regime and discussions from the global north and a lot of it doesn't include discussions of colonialism and coloniality and decolonialism and I think that that gets to interesting groups as well. I hope that We have exhausted our time. Okay. If you have other questions for uh, Andrew, you can go ahead and talk with him. But thank you, Andrew, for your presentation. And good